his own party, uh, it's really not enough to say, just like Margaret Thatcher said in 1987, I'll go on and on and on. Remember, Margaret Thatcher said that in 87. By 1990, she's out. I think Boris Johnson, having said, I'll be here till the 2030s, could well find himself out by the end of this year. In other news, families impacted by the COVID pandemic may take legal action against the government over delays to starting the coronavirus public inquiry. The COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group says the six-month delay in appointing a chairwoman and setting up a date goes beyond the reasonable time allowed by law. The Prime Minister previously said they agreed to do it in spring this year, but he hasn't set up a date for it yet. Police in South Africa are investigating deaths of 22 people at a nightclub. The bodies were found in the city of East London early on Sunday morning and several people are reported to have been injured. Police say all of those who were found dead are aged between 18 and 20 years old. The cause is still unknown. Prince Charles reportedly accepted a suitcase containing a million euros of cash from a Qatari Prime Minister. According to the Sunday Times, it was one of three cash donations from the former Prime Minister, Sheikh Hamad bin Jasmin, totalling three million euros. Clarence House says the donations were immediately passed to one of the Prince's charities and all the correct processes were followed. There is no suggestion that the payments were illegal. And killer drivers in England could spend their life behind bars under new rules coming into force this week. Reforms to the Crime and Sentencing Act will allow judges to hand down life sentences to dangerous drivers who kill and to careless drivers who kill whilst under the influence of drink or drugs. The current maximum penalty is 14 years. You're watching GB News. We're we'll bringing you more news as it happens now. It's time for Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Now, on that immigration point, folks, it's official, right, that the first asylum seekers in the UK to be sent to Rwanda are going to board their flight to the country on Tuesday. The High Court has ruled that around 31 people will be sent there, despite a legal bid to stop the removal of migrants to the East African country. In his decision, the judge accepted there was a material public interest in the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, being able to carry out her policies. But today, something arguably more controversial than the policy itself came about. There were reports of Prince Charles privately describing the government's Rwanda policy as appalling. This is the heir to the throne, of course, who is supposed to be politically impartial. And he's thought to be particularly uncomfortable with the scheme ahead of his visit to Rwanda, where he'll represent Her Majesty the Queen at the Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit. So, I'm asking, was Prince Charles right to have spoken out over the Rwanda plan? Joining me to discuss this is Stephen Wolfe, the director of, of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, and Jackie McKenzie, a migration and human rights lawyer. Stephen, can I start with you? Before we actually turn on to Prince Charles and the legitimacy of his arguments made admittedly in private and reported in today's Times, but a High Court ruling, which is pretty set in stone, right? Although campaigners do have the right to appeal, it looks as though the first migrants are actually going to take off to Rwanda from the UK on Tuesday. I just wondered if I could get your thoughts on that first of all. No, they won't go on Tuesday at the moment uh, because the High Court judge only gives the the first win to the government, but it also granted an appeal 
to those claiming that those uh, Rwandan uh, deportees should be stopped. And that will go on on Monday. And I'll be at the Court of Appeal watching for the decision. And that'll be much more important and much more significant because, of course, there were some really serious, important points raised in front of the High Court. And Jonathan Swift, the judge, uh, made it very clear that there was an important decision to be made that the government should be allowed to continue its policy. After all, it was voted to do so. But he also recognised that there were some legal claims to be addressed and only the Court of Appeal could address those specific points. So I think, Darren, what we'll be watching on Monday is a much more important aspect of this bigger battle because it's 30 or 34 that I think will be challenged and given that opportunity. If they do go and it's won on Tuesday, uh, Monday by the government, then there is a greater likelihood that they will go. But then there'll be other challenges along the lines to, I think, another 70 that are currently facing those same deportation uh, letters. Jackie, is this a sign of the High Court being on the side of the British people? Well, I think what's not been understood here is this is purely an application for interim relief so that there could be greater scrutiny of the actual Rwanda migration plan. This is not the case that's dealing with the substantive matters. That case is being heard in six to eight weeks' time, we're told. I mean, obviously, court schedules don't always stick to the time. But um, this is about whether it's irrational to rely on evidence um, put forward by the government on the basis that, you know, some evidence that we've had from the government on things like Partygate and COVID and so hasn't really been accurate. And you have the lead experts in this, the UNHCR, saying that the government has misrepresented their evidence. Um, so it was based on irrationality. It was also based on some other things around um, whether reformant um, would apply and whether uh, there were issues around malaria. Um, but what the judge said, what Sir Jonathan Swift said, was that um, the government has a right and shouldn't be impinged from um, promoting its po or, 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 or implementing its policy. Um, yeah. But that some of the points are arguable. So the ground regarding uh, irrationality on the basis of whether Rwanda is indeed a safe country. And we talked about jobs or in the lead up to this program, there was something about jobs. And we know that Rwanda has no jobs. It's got a GNI that's 40 times less than ours and a life expectancy that's 10 years less than ours. There are all those issues. So those things will come up in the substantive hearing. He also found that the, uh, the, the idea uh, or, the, or the evidence coming from World Health Organization about malaria is not, those are arguable points. He okay. just is not granting into relief. And of course, he gave uh, leave to appeal and we don't know what will happen in the appeal. Jackie, a lot of people watching though today will rightly, in my view, be thinking, well, hang on, Jackie, because 10,000 people have crossed the channel this year. Surely this is the right way to actually discourage people making those perilous journeys in unseaworthy vessels. Well, but they'd be wrong because it hasn't done that. I mean, remember, the migration plan has been spoken about. Remember, it was initially leaked and then, you know, it was out in the public. It's been in the public now for about eight weeks. And in that time, the numbers have increased. So it hasn't proved to be a deterrent. Okay. Uh, my own position on this is that because the Home Office themselves have told us that over 75% of people claiming asylum get it, and so therefore the majority of people, the vast majority, are genuine, um, people are going to have to come in whatever ways they can. We yeah. have this whole argument about safe routes. And yes, we could do more on safe routes, but there are always going to be people who are going to take perilous journeys because if you and your family are stuck somewhere and facing bombs or whatever you're facing, you're going to flee in whatever way. Oh, well, can. yes, but well, Jackie, I don't think if I was fleeing bombs, I wouldn't be fleeing France, would I? That's the, that's the problem well, here. Well, well, but I want to ask you, so Jackie, I want to ask you about many Prince people Charles. Stay in France. Well, three times uh, yeah. as many people stay in France and we're number 14 of the Schengen lists and you add us in, we're number 14 on the list. So it's a myth. And, and actually, France pays 20 euros a week more in benefits. So it's also a myth that people are coming. Well, well then benefits. why don't they stay There's there then? Charles. What are they fleeing? Baguettes? You know, this is just a nonsense. But Stephen, I well, want to ask be, you about I mean, Prince we be, Charles. We could, be, we could be ridiculous about it, but what we have is the data and we have to look at the data. We have about 30,000 people crossing yeah, Jackie, the channel. I've got to move um, on to Prince uh, Charles. Yeah. Prince Charles. Stephen, can I ask you, do you think actually the comments reportedly, I must, it, I must stress that, right, this is just reports in the press today, but they are reporting that in private Prince Charles has been saying that this policy, well, 
he fundamentally disagrees with it, frankly, ahead of the, representing Her Majesty the Queen in Rwanda. Do you agree that it's an absurd policy? It's a su silly and foolish comment to make by the future king if indeed he did so. It's foolish on the first hand because everybody has appreciated the Queen over her reign for the way that she stepped outside of politics. She's tried to bring the nation together. She hasn't been seen to be so supporting one side or another. And for the king, future king to do this will actually start to alienate many of those who are traditional supporters of the royal family. The second thing I think is really dangerous for him is the way that this comment will be read by those in the Commonwealth, and particularly in Rwanda. By saying the policy is wrong and foolish, it also is implicitly racist towards Rwanda not being capable or good enough to actually have an appropriate deal with the United Kingdom. And this goes along with what happened when we had the recent royal, uh, royal trip to, to the, to the uh, Bahamas and what the reaction of people to, there to the royal family based on the comments of Meghan Markle that the royal family was racist. This will feed into that. And, and thirdly, I think by stepping into the lines of, of policy and criticising the policy of a, uh, by the king, this doesn't set a good precedent for the royal okay. family in the future. Yeah, Jackie, uh, just we're stressing that we haven't got much time there, but do you actually feel it's right, given that we've just had that discussion where we disagree with each other, it's fundamentally, isn't it, a political issue? It's a live political issue with people on either side of the argument. So is it wrong for the future king to have actually had a say on, on what is a contentious issue? Well, I mean, he, is, he isn't the monarch, um, so he's entitled to have an opinion. Um, and there may well be some constitutional issues about him having those opinions, and I'm not a constitutional expert. Um, you know, but what it shows from his own personal perspective, you take him away from the royal family, that he's saying what a lot of people are saying. And on the point about racism, you know, I was in a meeting this morning with uh, leaders from the CARICOM, that's the Caribbean countries, who are going off to Rwanda for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And this isn't about saying that Rwanda isn't a fit country or isn't the right country, because even if they were going off to say, I don't know, Grenada or Dominica that doesn't appear to have any problems at all in terms of human rights, etc. People are saying Britain gets about 30,000 people out of 100 million displaced people around the world. It's a very rich nation and it should be seen to be doing its part. That's the concern that people have about this. Well, yeah, I mean, we're going to have to disagree, agree to disagree rather on that one, Jackie. But that was the director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, Stephen Wolfe, and the migration and human rights lawyer, Jackie McKenzie. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilized conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, 
and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. GB News Tavern is open on this bank holiday Monday and I'm joined by Lizzie Cundy, TV personality and the first football wag. Wow, <laughs> what that makes me sound old. <laughs> no, it wasn't meant to be said in Cheers, that way. Nigel. Good Cheers. to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. Mm. Now, you were in a way, weren't you, you know? Mm. Suddenly, the wives and girlfriends of footballers mm. became this big thing and it's gone on being. Yeah. A big thing. But now it seems the sort of legal fights going on between them. Well, that's and... it, yeah. Uh, wags at war, it is, it... indeed. But um, when it first started, it was in um, Baden-Baden, Germany, yeah. and uh, I was asked to go out and report for it for ITV. And let me tell you, I had never seen anything like it. It was like the Beatles had arrived. Everyone was screaming, paparazzi, going mad for these girls. And, you know, it was the press that called them wags. Yeah, yeah. All like, What's wags? You know, wives and girlfriends. And it, it just came a name. Some of them loved it, some of them loathed it. But um, and some made a living from it, like myself. Well, you, um, I mean, look, Lizzie, you know, <laughs> you've gone on to do just an extraordinary array of things. Mm. You know, you've done all sorts of TV, film, journalism, radio, telly. You're still writing, I think, for OK yes, and all yeah. these magazines. Uh, you've got your book out, yeah. you know, Tales from the Red Carpet. Indeed, Nigel. You we... even get a mention, I think. <laughs> You're <laughs> in there somewhere. Oh, there you are. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, what was it with you? I mean, you know, clearly, clearly, you know, in the, the marriage went wrong and that happens yeah. in life. But was it you sort of suddenly saw all these cameras and thought, I can do this? Well, you know what? I, I actually went on to this morning show with Jason, and he had um, testicular cancer. Yeah. And which, uh, I, which I'd had years ago too. I didn't yeah, know yeah, that, yeah, Nigel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I wanted to make a point that men were dreadful at going to the doctor, and Quite. you know, obviously, early detection is so important. Mm. Um, and I did a chat with them, and then afterwards they said, "Look, you're so comfy." on the sofa and easy to talk to. Would you do this other segment for us? And then it went on from there. And before I knew it, I was out with the World Cup for ITV. I had my own show called Wags World, where I'd go in <laughs> footballers' drawers and get the, you know, the wives to tell me all the secrets. That went on for eight years. And Richard Desmond asked me to do OK TV, which went on for another nine years in ITV at the movie. So really, it was a snowball effect. But my, sadly, marriage did split. Yeah. And I kind of had to reinvent myself. I had to work. I wasn't, um, you know, like some of these footballers' wages, which are sky high. Um, I had a family to look after, two boys. And all I thought, well, look, I'll, I'll be myself and um, know what I know, you know, and I love showbiz, love football. It's all a long way, isn't it, from mm. being raised by nuns at a Catholic school? <laughs> I know, if they could see me now. <laughs> but these nuns, it's true, are a very strict Catholic school. Yep. I mean, if you saw a man in the building, a builder, we were all like, wow, there's a man here. Um, but it was it was quite tough. But my father was in advertising, such and such. Yeah. And did lots of big brands. And so I, I made friends with the nuns and we used to do sort of deals. So I could go to Top of the Pops and go to these events when I shouldn't really be going. And they let me off getting, you know, coming in late. What well, you've done, I mean, the stuff you've <laughs> What's the most fun thing you've done in this sort of celeb media world? What's the most fun? Well, I, I love the National Telly Awards. I love the Oscars. That was incredible. And um, very luckily met some amazing people, been able to interview people I only ever dreamed of as a kid. Um, and it, it's, it's a, you know, it sounds glamorous. At times I'm waiting on the red carpet, posing like a teapot in the pouring rain mm. wind. But I have to say, Oscars was pretty cool. It was amazing. And I, I just think, you know, it's usually the real high up named celebrities are the kindest. Those that are, you know, not so, aren't so nice. But people like Tom Cruise, hilarious, you know, will come and say, join us for dinner. Yeah. Um, you know, really wonderful. Uh, and I've been very blessed, very lucky. I mean, Celeb World is, Celeb World is, it's, it's, it, 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 it shows no sign of going backwards. I mean, celebs become, in, in some ways, if you look at the younger generation, I, I, I think I could be wrong, 
But I think social media has accelerated well, celeb yeah. stardom uh, to such a level. I mean... I think it's because they, it, they can be accessible. You used to be Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, yep. front cover of a magazine. Yep. That doesn't sell anymore. Um, it, it's the, 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 the celebs we see on the TV, the wags, they sell newspapers, they sell magazines, because I think... You know, when you're little reading it or younger, you think, gosh, I've got a chance to be like that. When you see Hollywood signs, you think that's not obtainable. But how do these celebs stay sane? Because they can't get... I mean, you know, I've had a bit of it in a way, but, you know, you can't go to a restaurant, you can't go to a pub, and people have... I mean, you know, I've had it. I've been sitting on an aeroplane. People mm. walk up the aisle and go in front of you. And I mean, yeah. I mean, it, very difficult to live any sort of normal life as a celeb, isn't it? Yeah, but I think in some way, what well, I think of it is that you are very blessed in a blessed situation and um, I get many benefits. My friend Bruno Tonioli, I mean, when we're out for dinner, you can't get a minute to talk to ourselves because people are coming over yeah, asking about that's horrible, isn't it? And... But isn't that... I mean, I mean, it can be nice at times. Yeah, it can have its down parts. I, I find sometimes the intrusion into your private life and people writing things that aren't true can be tough. But I think you've got to take the tough, you know, the bad stuff with the good. And in a way, people say, well, you've sold your soul, you know, you're, you're on the Daily Mail or Lyle, you're mm. in... But, you, you know, you do have feelings. I'm, you know, I'm not a robot. But I find if you have a sense of humour, you can laugh it off. And I, I always laugh, cos... Yeah, like, I mean, you've had, some tough, you've had some tough times with the press, haven't you? Yeah, I have. And, uh, a, a, you know, big uh, divorce. I mean, only my mum knew that we were splitting. And before I knew it, there was a journalist on my doorstep saying, yeah. look, we're printing it either way. You tell me, or we're going to run it anyway. So it, that was tough. That was really tough when you've got two young kids and your private life haven't been the best at choosing men, Nigel, <laughs> which doesn't do me any favours. <laughs> but, um... I, well, I have I had, I had read about it. <laughs> I you know. Know. We'll forget about that one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it can be tough, that side of it. Mm. And you and often think, are people with you because they want to get in the paper or they're thinking they can get some sort of fame or lifestyle? That It's hard to trust. Has Leveson changed this a little bit? Has Leveson... Yeah. Leveson has... I mean, I, I think before, what was happening with celebs you know, was that journalists would trespass on land, take a photograph of people in a private situation around a swimming pool or whatever it was, and that was fair game to publish, and that isn't now. So yeah. is, is the balance a bit more reasonable? It is, it is, Nigel. And in Leveson, they can't just write willy-nilly anything which yeah. it used to be. Yeah. I mean, I remember picking up a certain newspaper thinking, where have they got this from? And it was totally made up, and other sources were getting paid huge amounts of money. And... Well, the worst thing is when well, they write bad stories, isn't they're true. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't talk about those, I know. <laughs> oh, my poor mum, when she read some of the stories, it's like, yeah, it's true. But, um, yeah, Leveson has helped. Yeah. But, um, and the our press, I think, get a hard time uh, at times. Um, you know, we have, say, Meghan Markle usually whinging and moaning about oh. the press, taking them to court. But we forget, when she first arrived on the scene, everyone welcomed her with open arms. The press was, um, you know, so good about her, more so than Kate. It was incredible when you look at the... Oh, it was a the real press... fairy tale start, it wasn't was, it? It was, indeed. Yeah, no, every, and it, the longest honeymoon you've ever had. Oh. Now, you knew her going back a bit, didn't you? I knew her in, when she was in a show called Suits. Yeah. We're going back... Uh, I mean, I didn't know who she was at the time. And I was at a charity event, um, and I think you may know him, John Caldwell. Yeah. And he said, look, can, look, can you sit next to this girl? Um, she's flown in from Canada. And I wanted to be with my mates. I was like, no, I'm going to... I want to sit with my friends and have a giggle. He was like, no, look after her. But actually, we got on really, really well, and, had a, and we did have a huge giggle, and she wanted to find an English boyfriend. So I said, look, I'll help you. So I was going through my phone. There was Ashley Cole, Chelsea footballer. Um, I was trying, but um, yeah, it was it was quite funny. But she did want to have an English. That boyfriend. was her plan all along. Yeah, and she liked she yeah. loved being here in in London. So she wanted to work here. She actually wanted to be in Made in Chelsea, the show. I remember saying she loved the show. Really. But she was she was a real good fun girl. And how she behaved since. Well, no, she ghosted me and Piers Morgan. Uh, she didn't... Uh, oh, when she got with Prince Harry and it all, you know, happened, mm. she she did cut off a lot of people, which I understand, cos I think celebrity is very different to, to royalty. Of course. But, of course. Um, no, I, you know, and I've been quite vocal on how I feel 
Yeah. They've behaved. Yeah. Well, um, well, you're never back. Backwards are coming forwards, Lizzie. But you know, away from all of the celeb yes. and the stardusty stuff. There's actually quite a serious political, you know, sort of political side to you, isn't there? You, you, yeah. you, you're very into your politics. I love my politics. You much. really care. I know we've debated it before. You're passionate okay. about things. Um, but Boris Johnson, I think, I think you're feeling a bit disappointed, aren't you? I'm very disappointed in him, yeah. And um, I couldn't say goodbye to a very dear friend of mine that passed away through the pandemic. And then when I, you know, saw our Queen sitting on her own at her husband's funeral, and there he is partying on. Um, it, it gets to me, and I, I can't forgive and forget it. And I know he will hope it will go away and Sue Gray report, let's put it off mm. with everything else. But I, I really don't think, for me and many others, and thousands and thousands of families out there that can say goodbye to their loved ones can forget it. And I'm sorry, if we haven't got a Prime Minister we can trust, that is... I mean, how can we go on? But it was interesting. I don't know whether you saw earlier on, I had a, you know, quite a well-known pollster on earlier, you know, 72 per cent in one poll, 75 in another, think the Prime Minister is a liar. Now, you know, if we'd said that 20, 40 years ago, it would have been unthinkable mm. that anybody could be in that position mm. as PM. Mm. But interesting what Chris Curtis said. He said, the trouble is, he said, actually, the public think they're all liars, so Boris Johnson is not as disadvantaged <laughs> by this. Uh, but you feel it, it, it is a matter of trust. In well, it is a matter of trust. And if we, we can't trust our own Prime Minister, I mean, we're becoming the laughing stock of every... I don't believe anything now he says. And I know we're, we've, we, it's horrific what's happening in the Ukraine. And people are saying, mm. oh, there are far more important things. Actually, you know what? This is still important and it's not going to go away. And I think he's hoping we can brush it under the carpet. But no, we can't. Thoughts on, uh, thoughts on Pretty Patel's plan for Rwanda? Will it stop the cross channel? Problem? I don't know, Nigel. I heard you earlier. Mm. But I, I, it's very sad. I, it's just a whole sad situation. But I, I just don't like. I just think if you're going to take that crossing, you know you want to get here for a better life. And you, you know, and. But sending them back, will it deter them? Will it stop them? I think it might. I think it might do that. If, yeah, I, mean, I think this is my view. If they actually did send people to Rwanda, then why would you pay two and a half thousand no. quid to a criminal gang to get you across the channel? But will know? it stop the criminal gangs? They'll still continue, will it? I mean... Well, I, at the end of the day, it's all about those who are paying the traffickers. I mean, look, let's see where we go with it. It's very, very new. I mean, I'm giving her credit for at least trying something. Mm. Uh, you know, and it is an ongoing problem and it is an issue. So what's going to happen post-Boris? Who is there post-Boris? Can you see the next leader? Nigel, what happened to you? Come well, on, I'm Nigel! Not either, but they won't have me in the Conservative Party, <laughs> so it can't no, be I me. I'm too much the outsider, you know. Nigel, I think we've got to get some... I don't know, one of the backbenchers, Bernard Jenkins, I used to... Uh, I mean, I, I know you're <laughs> laughing, but... I no, I'm not laughing. We need someone that yeah. we can feel we can believe in again. Yeah. No, absolutely. And Boris, for me, has become a bit of a Didn't buffoon. Didn't Great you. showman. Look, oh. He's like Trump on a budget. Oh. He's your friend. <laughs> he is, isn't he? Great showman. Uh, do, you know, for the, the shows he's great at, but... Yeah, he's a cheerleader. He's a great cheerleader. Mm. I've always thought that, you know. Have I got news for you? He's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. not as our Prime Minister. No, we well, have to have someone who we can trust. I think a growing number of people think, Lizzie, that you're right on that. Now, look, you mentioned the Oscars earlier. Yeah. Um, I just have to ask you about this trans issue, which seems to dominate so much public conversation mm. these days, whether it's women's sport and it's Leah Thomas, the, swim, the swimmer, uh, whether it's the Oscars now not having best woman actor mm. and best female actress. I, I, are we losing our minds? I think it's gone one step too far, and I think the woke brigade have come in and we can't... I think it's sad. I mean, look at Adele. She even said it when she won the award. You can't be celebrated as a female artist. She said it with passion, didn't she? And she said it with passion. And the music industry is a very male orientated industry, as is the film business. And not to be celebrated as a woman, to strive and get through what you've got through to be celebrated. And we are different. Let's be honest. It's, it's, it's genetics. We are different. And thank oh, the Lord we that. are. Well, you can't say that. You're <laughs> no, but we are different in some ways. And I just think it's... A, I, I know we have to move on in times, but it's sad we can't be celebrated. Uh, I, I think it's quite sad. And look, we've got the Soap Awards there I've heard that have, have scraps. Having any, uh, you know, best actress, best actor, it's all gone. It's crackers. And I just feel that some of the actresses and actors will lose out because of that. Yeah. 
That's my view. No, there's no doubt. Lizzie Candy, thank you for joining me on Talking Pines. Lovely to see you now. Really? Cheers. Cheers. Good afternoon, you're watching GB News. I'm Bethany Elsie, here to get you up to date with the latest headlines. Boris Johnson is pushing for the West to continue support for Ukraine at the G7 summit in Germany. He says the ban on Russian gold will cut supply to Vladimir Putin's war machine. The UK, US, France, Japan and Canada have all agreed to the ban. They're also discussing placing a price cap on Russian oil. The European Council President Charles Michel agrees, saying the G7 leaders share the same goal. With G7 countries, we all share the same goals. To cut the oxygen from Russia's war machine while taking care of our economies and the economies of our partners. The EU will stand by the people of Ukraine for the long haul to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity and to strongly defend our common democratic values. For you. Meanwhile, missile strikes have hit the Ukrainian capital for the first time in weeks. A seven-year-old girl trapped underneath fallen rubble had to be pulled to safety after Russian forces hit homes near Kiev. At least five others were hurt. The city's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, says medics are still trying to save the child's mother and others are still trapped. <laughs> The building has been destroyed and we understand that there are people under rubble. They are alive. The rescuers are trying to get them out. There is a lot of smoke and we are doing our best to rescue them as soon as possible. Boris Johnson has said he's planning to serve two more terms in office, despite the Conservative Party suffering two by-election defeats this week. The Prime Minister said he's actively thinking about leading the country into the 2030s. Well, amid calls from within his own party to resign, he urged Tory MPs not to focus on the mistakes he might have made. Families impacted by the COVID pandemic may take legal action against the government over delays to starting the coronavirus public inquiry. The COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group says the six-month delay in appointing a chair and setting up date goes beyond the reasonable time allowed by law. The Prime Minister previously said they agreed to do it in spring this year, but he hasn't set up a date for it yet. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with Darren, McC Darren soon. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship 
and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for your company. Now, folks, on Thursday, the Conservative Party lost two vital by-elections in both Wakefield and Tiverton and Honiton. The party chairman, Oliver Dowden, resigned at 5.30am, mounting further pressure on the Prime Minister. Interestingly, though, the Tory vote in Tiverton didn't go down by a very large amount. The swing away from the Tories was largely due to tactical voting, with the anti-Tory vote all going to the Liberal Democrats, rather than splitting with Labour. So will tactical voting be a feature of the next election? Is this a fix against the Tories? And what should the parties take away from these by-elections? Well, I'm delighted to say that joining me now is the lecturer in British politics, Dr David Jeffrey. David, thank you very much for your time. What role do you think tactical voting actually did play in these by-elections? And do you reckon the Tories have got to get used to this happening come the general? Uh, well, yes, it clearly made a massive difference uh, in these in these by elections, and it's essentially part of the system, right? If you are an anti conservative voter in Tiverton and you don't want to see a conservative MP, then it makes complete sense. It's completely logical to vote for the Liberal Democrats in the same way that in Wakefield it made complete sense to vote for Labour, and the Conservatives can complain about that uh, all they want, but that is a a feature that is the only opportunity to voters in the system that they're actively backing. And it's quite interesting to the Conservatives are complaining essentially about a key part of this voting system, whilst they then also extend the voting system first past the post to other positions that we have in the UK for, you know, including Metro mayors. So they, they can't really complain about what people do under first past the post when they're looking to expand it themselves. Well, if you consider then under proportional representation, the Tories obviously wouldn't be gaining as many seats as they did in 2019, of course. What do you actually think the future, if I can ask you, David, to play the role of Mystic Meg for a second, but what do you think the future of the Tory party would actually look like if the electoral system was changed? Well, I won't get my crystal ball out on TV, but I think <laughs> if we did have a form of PR, we'd, we'd probably see, uh, uh, we'd see a centre-left coalition basically, the, the Lib Dems and, and Labour, and then against a, a centre-right coalition that would be rooted in the Conservative Party, but that would bring in the Brexit Party as well. And so, in some ways, perhaps Boris Johnson would have been in a stronger position under a form of PR, and the Conservatives probably would have been in a stronger position because they would have had UKIP and then the Brexit Party uh, with a significant number of seats. Let's not forget, UKIP won 12% of the vote in 2015 and, and ended up with just one seat, which is massively disproportionate. And so the advocates of PR, which generally come from the left, but not, not exclusively, tend to forget this, that there would be about 80, 90 UKIP MPs in the House of Commons in, after 2015. And there's nobody else they go into coalition with, really, apart from the Conservatives. So it would actually put the Conservatives in, um, well, maybe not a stronger position after 2019, but it would certainly it would certainly soften the edges of any defeats they might have because they would have coalition partners. Yeah. I mean, I'm wondering then, the Labour Party and the Lib Dems have been on the airwaves this morning, and both of them have been sort of, I, I guess, showing a little bit of leg, David, but not actually suggesting that they're about to hop into bed with each other. But do you think that they're taking the electorate for fools? Do you think it's ultimately inevitable that these two parties, without Labour winning, making significant gains in Scotland, will end up seeking coalition with each other? I think they'll have to if it seems at the moment, it still seems unlikely that Labour will win a majority. And like you say, without Scotland, that, that, that's even more difficult. Um, and after 2010, the Liberal Democrats would probably never go into a coalition with the Conservatives for, for next, another generation. So this leaves Labour only with the Liberal Democrats. Now, whether that's taking the electorate for fools, I, I don't know, because it seems to me that the people in, in Tiverton and the people in Wakefield knew exactly what they were doing when they cast their votes. Either they were voting for, essentially for Boris Johnson or against him. Um, and it seems that in both cases, the against vote won. Um, we've seen a rise in tactical voting. It's never quite been the dog that, that barked um, 
so it's never it's never bit yet but it seems increasingly likely that these two parties will stop short of a full electoral pact because voters don't like being denied the choice but for voters who do want to know who's best placed to defeat the conservatives then this is the only tool really that labor and the liberal democrats have without really offending yes. public opinion and it's and worth noting PMs. as well that we're not speaking about the Greens yeah. here either, right? They're, they're kind of frozen out of this because really they're not very important in this. Well, exactly. But I'm wondering then, the uh, Prime Minister this morning saying he's going to stay on and, as long as Maggie did, right? So uh, until 2030, he was saying this morning. I mean, that, if we consider that these two by-elections were perhaps a referendum on Boris Johnson, as I think you suggest, David, does that suggest that he's, his days are numbered? I mean, anybody who narrowly escapes a confidence motion with such a small majority as he did, his, his days are numbered anyway. And if Tory MPs aren't going to remove him, it seems quite clear that the electorate will. And what is quite interesting at the moment is the Conservative Party's brand is much, uh, is, is much stronger than Boris Johnson's own personal brand. So time is running out, really, for Conservative MPs to, to make a move. Um, and if they leave it too late, it will be seen as very cynical. Well, speaking of that polling, though, David, as well, one thing that I've noticed is that the, the uh, I guess, the traditional stereotypes that you would apply to the Conservative Party, strong on law and order, big on defence, sure, they've still got the two of those. But when it comes to things like uh, management of the economy, taxes and general uh, not pandering to what I would consider to be the green extreme, David, I think actually the polls would suggest that people are changing their view of those core stereotypes of the Conservative brand. Is that fair? I think so, yeah. I mean, it's important to remember we're seeing inflation, which is traditionally historically deadly for governments. Um, we're, we're seeing examples of poor handling of the economy. Taxes are going up. We can all see that in our pay packets. So all these things that people vote Conservative for aren't being followed so it seems to it seems to me that boris johnson so poisoned his own brand and he's kind of taking the conservative party down with him slowly the best thing would be for mps to get a collective backbone and find somebody else and i mean it, it, people always say it's not clear who the next leader could be but people always seem to think that and then you do get a new leader and all of a sudden it, people will look back and go oh it was obvious it could only have been that person well, David, we'll see what's going to happen, because, I mean, Boris Johnson has been written out before and come back galloping on a sort of valiant steed like no one expected. So, David, we'll see. But thank you for playing my mystic, Meg. That was the lecturer in British politics, Dr. David Jeffrey. Now, folks, nine in 10 businesses are concerned about costs of funding the transition to net zero or net stupid, in my view. Amid a surge in energy prices, new research from NPower Business Solutions revealed this week. A huge 82% of businesses believe more needs to be done by government and one in five currently believe nothing is being done at all by policymakers. A grim outlook from business, if you ask me, but will the government actually start to listen on this net stupid policy? Well, with me now is the director of Net Zero Watch, Benny Pizer. Benny, thank you for your time. What are the results of this survey, the business, business energy tracker survey, and why are they so utterly concerning and condemning, frankly, of our current energy policy as a nation? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, well, it's quite obvious. Um, households have known um, energy price rises. The households are struggling and um, many businesses uh, can't pass on these uh, high energy costs to their consumers. And um, the, the Association of Small Businesses estimates that about 500,000 small businesses might go under. Um, at the end of this year when energy prices are going to rise again by a third or so to up to £3,000 per household. So, um, you know, forget about party gate and forget about everything. If the government cannot bring down the cost of energy, they are toast. And ben that the government, they, they would argue that actually, you know, we're going hell for leather, getting us off of hydrocarbons by investing in these green technologies like solar and wind. Surely that's enough to heat our gas boilers, isn't it, Benny? <laughs> well, that's 
that's exactly the problem. The government uh, has been completely naive, uh, thinking that uh, shutting down coal-fired power plants and phasing down uh, old nuclear power plants and going to renewables would bring down the cost. But in reality, costs are going up. They're going up. They continue to go up. They might not even finish at the end of the year. All the billions and billions we have to spend on renewables have to be cut from the energy bills, and we have to throw the sink at this problem and bring down energy costs. Because as I said, 500,000 businesses are facing bankruptcy because they cannot uh, afford these high energy bills, and yeah. millions of households won't be able to pay their bills. So this is the challenge. And as I said, Boris, uh, you know, regardless what you think of him, uh, he's part of the problem because he's yeah, refused well, radical reforms and he still refuses any reforms. And so energy prices are going up and this will, in all likelihood, uh, cost him his job. I have no doubt about so that. So, Benny, in a sentence then, before you tell me about your net zero report, what actually would make prices cheaper of energy bills? Oh, that there is, uh, you can, there are some short term cuts you can do and some medium term. So short term, get rid of the green levies uh, from the energy bills. That saves you roughly 160 uh, pounds. Uh, get rid of VAT, get rid of VAT or, or, or cut VAT, which could- A promise of Brexit, also... Benny. This was a promise of Brexit. Well, th there you go, there you have it. Um, so there are short term measures that the governments could take. And I'm talking here VAT, not just on, energy bills, but VAT on anything to do, you know, with services and goods that are energy related, it could cut uh, households bill by thousands Absolutely. of pounds. If the government. So the government Common has an option. Spending. They are refusing to do it. They are refusing. They their net zero agenda is their top priority, which is absolutely exactly. Benny, tell me about your report. Which report? <laughs> Your net, your Which new net zero it? watch report, new one out today. Oh, right. Okay, so we obviously suggest to the treasury to if if they want to avoid a an economic and social disaster in the winter when energy prices are expected to go up another thousand pounds per household, to cut VAT not just on energy but VAT on services and goods that are related to energy costs. It is now time, now they can't, the government can't wait any longer to actually yeah. introduce radical policy changes to avoid a major disaster in the winter. That's what yeah, the government has to do. Stuff, Benny. I agree, common yeah. sense stuff. That was the director of Net Zero Watch, Benny Pizer there. Thank you very much for your time, Benny. Now, next up, the activist Jack Ross, founder of Vans Without Borders, has been providing vital food and supplies to people affected by the war in Ukraine. He's crowdfunded and helped British volunteers travel to Ukraine and aims to reach areas other aid workers have potentially neglected. Jack's a man who puts his money where his mouth is, and I'm delighted to say it joins me now from Ukraine, founder of Vans Without Borders, Jack Ross. Jack, thank you very much for your company. Can you quickly tell us what is Vans Without Borders? So, Vans Without Borders is an organisation I set up in March where we heard about the atrocious um, situation in Ukraine, particularly the atrocities committed by Russian soldiers and thought we've got to do something. Um, so I bought myself a transit van We just lost Jack there from Ukraine. So as you can imagine, the signal's not all that brilliant at the moment. But Fans Without Borders is a fantastic campaign that Jack has set up. He has videos across social media of him handing out with activists who have gone out there from this country putting themselves at risk, actually, to help people in Ukraine. A really beautiful, laudable thing. I'm sorry that we couldn't speak to him. But folks, moving on, the Prince of Wales has accepted countries who still call the Queen their head of state 
that to choose their own destiny, right? Replace the Queen potentially with a president. Speaking at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda on Friday, the heir to the throne also acknowledged the royal family's role in historic slave trade. Our royal reporter Cameron Walker reports. Friendship, loyalty and a desire for freedom and peace. Her Majesty the Queen's vision for a Commonwealth which bears no resemblance to the empires of the past. 70 years later, her son Charles accepts that countries who still have a British sovereign as their head of state may want to choose a different path. Each member's constitutional arrangement as republic or monarchy is purely a matter for each member country to decide. Arrangements such as these can change calmly and without rancor. There was no apology from the heir to the throne for the royal family's historic role in the transportation of East African slaves to the Americas, whose ancestors now debate republicanism versus royalty. Instead, the prince decided to acknowledge the wrongs and urged Commonwealth leaders to do the same. Earlier this week, Prince Charles came face to face with the grim reality of the 1994 genocide against Tutsis in Rwanda. Rows of skulls belonging to some of the estimated 800,000 victims. And it was Eric Marangwa's suggestion, a survivor of the genocide, who encouraged Charles to visit the memorial and reconciliation village. Eric thinks the prince's visit will help more people understand what happened and how Rwanda's rebuilding. It's a very important action to, to us Rwandans, particularly survivors, but it's also a very important message to the rest of the world. It will help people to to understand more about Rwanda and uh, to appreciate uh, how, how far this country has, has come. The Prince represented the Queen yesterday and met Prime Minister Boris Johnson for a meeting that lasted just 15 minutes. The elephant in the room? Prince Charles's reported comments where he branded the government's scheme to send asylum seekers to Rwanda appalling. Prince Charles will one day succeed his mother as head of the Commonwealth and as head of state. And a source close to the prince says just as with meetings with the Queen, what the Prime Minister and the Prince of Wales discuss is private. Clarence House previously stressed the prince remains politically neutral. Cameron Walker, GB News. Folks, it has ever been thus, right, that these Commonwealth members are free to come and go as they please as democratic nations. But folks, you're watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Looking ahead, we're going to go off now to the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking fine but breezy in the southeast, wet with windy weather further north and west. Let's take a look at the details. In southwest England there will be some showers for northern and western parts, further east it will be drier and sunnier but blustery. In southeast England there will be plenty of sunshine as we head into the evening, it will be dry here with some high level cloud. Western parts of Wales will still be windy, especially around the coast, with the showers continuing here. Further east, it will be drier. The West Midlands is looking mostly fine through into the evening, though you can't rule out one or two showers still popping up here and there. There will still be a breeze too. The weather should be mostly fine and quite warm for northeast England too. Again, a few showers are possible, but mostly here we'll avoid them, especially nearer the coast. There will be plenty of showers across Scotland, the heaviest in the west, with some eastern parts perhaps staying mostly dry. It will be windy too, though the strongest winds easing. It is a similar picture for Northern Ireland here and there. will also be plenty of showers as we head through the end of the day, with some blustery winds as well. The showery rain will continue to spread from the north and west overnight. East southeastern parts will remain fine. That's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays.
We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. We've got an absolutely crack and show lined up for you today. We're going to be discussing the Rotherham grooming scandal, Wimbledon and the prospect of a summer of travel chaos. But first, it's the news with Bethany Elsie. Darren, thank you. It's just gone three o'clock. I'm Bethany Elsie, here to get you up to date from the GB newsroom. Boris Johnson is pushing for the West to continue support for Ukraine at the G7 summit in Germany. He says the ban on Russian gold will cut supply to Vladimir Putin's war machine. The UK, US, France, Japan and Canada have all agreed to the ban. They're also discussing placing a price cap on Russian oil. The European Council President, Charles Michel, agrees, saying the G7 leaders share the same goal. With G7 countries, we all share the same goals. To cut the oxygen from Russia's war machine while taking care of our economies and the economies of our partners. The EU will stand by the people of Ukraine for the long haul to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity and to strongly defend our common democratic values. Deadly missile strikes have hit the Ukrainian capital for the first time in weeks. A seven-year-old girl trapped underneath fallen rubble had to be pulled to safety after Russian forces hit homes and a kindergarten near Kiev. At least one person died and six others were hurt. The city's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, says medics are still trying to save the child's mother and others are still trapped. The building has been destroyed and we understand that there are people under rubble. They are alive. The rescuers are trying to get them out. There is a lot of smoke and we are doing our best to rescue them as soon as possible. Boris Johnson said he's planning to serve two more terms in office despite the Conservative Party suffering two by-election defeats this week. The Prime Minister said he's actively thinking about leading the country into the 2030s. Well, amid calls from within his own party to resign, he's urged Tory MPs not to focus on the mistakes he might have made. The Northern Ireland Secretary Brandon Lewis told GB News the PM's optimism is a good thing. 
And we often get criticised in politics and in government around looking at the next election, the next week, the next few years at most. Having somebody who's looking at that long term benefit, long term development of our country, I think is a good thing. And the enthusiasm and the drive and the energy that the prime minister's got for that, the determination around that, I think is a is a really positive thing. Well, Professor of International Politics at the University of Birmingham, Scott Lucas, told GB News he doesn't expect Mr Johnson to survive until the end of this year. He's in trouble over the economy. He's in trouble over uh, his own statements with Partygate. When he's lost the confidence of almost 80% of his back ventures of his own party, uh, it's really not enough to say, just like Margaret Thatcher said in 1987, I'll go on and on and on. Remember, Margaret Thatcher said that in 87. By 1990, she's out. I think Boris Johnson, having said, I'll be here till the 2030s, could well find himself out by the end of this year. In other news, police in South Africa are investigating the deaths of 22 people at a nightclub. The bodies were found in the city of East London early on Sunday morning, and several people are reported to have been injured. Police say all of those found dead are aged between 18 and 20 years old. The cause is still unknown. Families impacted by the COVID pandemic may take legal action against the government over delays to starting the coronavirus public inquiry. The COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group says the six-month delay in appointing a chair and setting up a date goes beyond the reasonable time allowed by law. The Prime Minister previously said he agreed to do it in spring this year, but he hasn't set up a date for it yet. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now, though. Let's get back to Real Britain with Darren. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Here's what's coming up over the next hour. Are we heading for a bummer summer? Flight cancellations, fuel shortages, and now a new wave of strikes in airports. I'll be talking to experts. And a new report on Rotherham where 1,400 girls were groomed and abused, has slammed failings at the police, but no officers have lost their jobs. I'll be speaking to a whistleblower. And venison is on the menu with deer populations booming and a cull planned. Can we ease the cost of living crisis by eating British meat? Bambi, better watch out. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd absolutely love to know your thoughts, though. What do you make of the Rotherham grooming scandal report? Have the police learnt their lesson? Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Absolutely tons of brilliant content on our page there. Cheers very much. In today's identity-obsessed West, identity matters above all else until your identity gets you butchered by Islamist ideology. We're a nation increasingly obsessed with diversity. If you're gay, bi, trans, and whatever more recent attachment to that LGBT alphabet soup there is today, as long as you're not straight and preferably not white, well, kid, you'll go far. Despite this, you probably haven't heard about the more recent murders of gay people in Europe at the hands of Islamist terror. In Oslo last weekend, two people died and a further 21 were wounded after shootings in and around the London pub, a popular gay venue there. In Sligo Island earlier this year, two gay men were beheaded. And, you may not be aware, but in June 2020, here in Blighty, three gay men were stabbed to death in Redden. Had these attacks been at the hands of some white neo-Nazi, you would know about it because our news outlets would feel comfortable reporting the facts and just how pro the LGBT community they are, whatever that means. But when, folks, it's Islamist terror, it'll be dismissed as a mental health issue. Maybe it was a trauma of coming here as a refugee from a war-torn nation, some form of PTSD. But still, it's never, never, folks, the barbaric ideology that underpins these murderous crusades. Identity matters until you're at risk of highlighting the Islamist threat to that diverse array of identities in Britain. 
This all comes just days after the publication of a £6 million investigation report by the Independent Office for Police Conduct Watchdog, which found South Yorkshire officers failed to protect vulnerable kids between 97 and 2013. An eight-year-long, six million quid investigation into the Rotherham Grumman gang scandal, and not one, I repeat, not one single officer has been held responsible for these numerous failings during a time in which over 1,400 girls were sexually abused in Rotherham. That's 1,400 girls whose lives were dismissed as unimportant because authorities feared that they might be accused of racism. As it was previously claimed in the government's Alexis J report, this new report even claims an officer working for South Yorkshire Police gave one of the country's worst child abusers a no arrest deal after he abducted a teenager. You see, folks, identity matters. Being a woman matters. Being part of the LGBT plus alphabet soup matters. Until, until you're sexually abused or murdered by somebody higher up the identity pecking order than you. Then it's silence and a cross of the fingers in hope that this all goes away. Islamism is different from Islam. Of course it is. One is a religion and one a fascist ideology. Some followers of Islam face discrimination, like some followers of Christianity do. That's wrong, but this fact shouldn't make us fear criticising Islamism and wrongs committed by followers of a certain religion. To hold Muslims to a lower standard, as I believe South Yorkshire police did, is itself racist. I wonder when we might say enough is enough, especially when many undocumented men are coming over the English Channel. Goodness only knows, folks, how many of them share our values on women's rights and LGBT plus equality. But we can't discuss these issues. Hell, folks, I might even be removed from Twitter.com for saying this right now. But in my view, to hell with it. No conversation should be off limits, especially conversations about a life-threatening and life-ruining pandering to a barbaric Islamist sect. The Prime Minister is set to impose new steel tariffs as part of an effort to protect this vital industry from being decimated by cheap foreign imports flooding the UK after the pandemic. Reporting the news this morning, the Telegraph claim that the policy is aimed at boosting support in red wall seats, where manufacturing jobs are primarily based. So is this smart economic nationalism or regressive protectionism? Well, joining me now is the director of the Adam Smith Institute, Dr. Eamon Butler. Dr. Eamon Butler, I can guess what your view is. What does this mean, though, for British Steel? Do you think imposing tariffs to actually protect this industry will mean that British Steel thrives? No, uh, because uh, if you look at uh, Trump uh, in 2018, put a 25% tariff um, on steel imports into the United States, supposedly to uh, to save jobs in the, in the Midwest. And overall, the job losses probably exceeded the gains uh, for various reasons. I mean, uh, you need a large bureaucracy to police this for a start. You get appeals and court cases. So a lot of people are tied up in that. Um, the fact that you can't buy cheaper steel from overseas means that uh, steel prices rise. And that, of course, hits car makers. It hits uh, manufacturers, anybody who uses steel, in fact. Uh, and so people buy foreign cars and, and for, foreign washing machines and, and all the rest of it instead. Um, so overall, uh, the, uh, the job losses probably exceed any, any gains from this policy. But Eamon, a lot of my viewers watching this today will be saying, OK, well, that's all well and good. They may well accuse you, Eamon, of being a free market fundamentalist. They actually believe that we need to protect the steel industry for defence purposes and other issues around national security. Do you not agree with that view? No, I don't think this is a very conservative uh, policy at, at all to be to be protectionist like this. Um, steel prices go up and down. Uh, it's a very cyclical industry. When things are uh, are, are going well, steel um, and other uh, resources that you need to uh, to build industries and so on, uh, 
that shoots up. And then when things are, are bad, then it shoots down again. And steelmakers have to have deep enough pockets to ride out those big ups and downs um, but because they do happen. And that's what's happening at, at the moment. And uh, if you if you cut off uh, foreign supplies. All you're doing is to uh, pander to the uh, to the your domestic uh, producers and, and feather bed them and make them less efficient than they might otherwise be. Okay, Eamon, but what about our reliance upon China, for example? What can we do in order to wean ourselves off of the teat of the Chinese communists? <laughs> well, I think we should do an awful lot, frankly. I mean, I think I think we should see in that in that case, yes. I, I think we should see trade as being part of foreign policy. Uh, we don't want to buy stuff from bad guys, and uh, the Chinese are proving themselves uh, one one day at a time uh, to be, to be bad guys. Uh, and it's the same same with Russia. We need to to wean ourselves off uh, uh, Russian energy, and Europe uh, in particular, the EU in particular, needs to do that. Uh, um, you, you've got to have an alternative. That is true, but uh, it's a big world out there. We can buy steel from uh, from anywhere in the world. We don't have to buy it from China, um, and uh, we, I don't think we do buy much from China. Uh, and also, of course, you know, remember that a lot of steel is specialist steel that we don't necessarily make in this country. Uh, steel comes in all sorts of um, sizes and, and qualities. And that was another thing which uh, the Americans found when Trump imposed tariffs on steel in, in America, that uh, manufacturers who needed special specialist steel couldn't actually get it. Um, so it's much better to, to be in the world market and uh, uh, keep yourself open to, to uh, competitors from abroad. It keeps you on your toes, but it also means that your own manufacturers can get the steel that they want. Eamon, what I think ultimately is that the steel industry in this country had a kiss of death given to it when Theresa May, remember her, signed net zero by 2050 into law. Mm -hmm. To me, it's fundamentally incompatible with a energy intensive industry such as steel. So is this just the kiss of death for, for the steel industry well, without these tariffs prematurely, perhaps? Uh, it's certainly true. It's a very high energy uh, using uh, industry, and, and therefore that must have made a difference. I mean, I mean, I think our steel industry suffers from half a century of public ownership. It was, it was uh, expanded really in the 50s and 60s. Uh, that long ago, uh, as, as a state industry, it was only privatised under Mrs. Thatcher in, in the eighties, um, and uh, it, it it really was a basket case. It really had to turn itself down, even around, even to uh, uh, to be saleable. Um, so there's still that overhang in British steel making, and I'm, I'm not. Sh I don't know what his future is. If I knew that, I'd be a billionaire. But uh, I. I, I think that there are plenty of people who are producing steel in, in other countries that is of, of better quality uh, than we can we can make, and better quality than the Americans can make. Do you think Mrs. Thatcher will be turning in her grave, Eamon? <laughs> well, yes, indeed. As I say, it's not a very conservative uh, uh, policy. The and, and one, of course, one of the arguments for Brexit was that we could get out of EU tariffs on everything, and you know, and become part of the world trading system uh, and be open to free trade uh, with anybody that wanted to trade for us. And here we are. The first thing we do is slap a tariff on something. It doesn't send out the right signal that Britain is open for business and that Britain actually wants to be a free trading nation and to make other. Nations nations, free trading nations too. Okay, Eamon, we'll leave it there. That was the director of the Adam Smith Institute with brilliant analysis, Dr. Eamon Butler. Now, the Prime Minister, folks, is in Rwanda this week where he defended his policy of sending illegal migrants to the East African nations to actually deter dangerous crossings of across that English Channel. Opponents have claimed the policy is immoral, but what is the accommodation being offered to the migrants actually like? Our political editor was in Rwanda yesterday to find out. In Kigali, it's come as a guest, leave as a friend. This is, frankly, the accommodation that the British government hope that hundreds, thousands of failed migrants to the UK will end up here in Rwanda. But at the moment, there's no one in them. They're entirely empty. And that is because, of course, of those court rulings, which meant that those planes could not take off, which has meant that the government's policy is in peril. They insist, and the Prime Minister here in Rwanda is insistent, that he wants this plan to work, that it's a sensible plan, a plan that will act as a deterrent to stop people crossing the English Channel in those small boats. 
But it is also a costlier plan, a plan that's cost over £100 million to UK taxpayers. And the big question for the government is, can they make it work? But also a big question for us, given the questions that are being raised, given the comments by Prince Charles, who allegedly call this uh, appalling, this policy, is what is the actual accommodation like? What are the areas, the facilities like for the migrants that may well end up here? So let's have a look inside. And so this is the main reception area inside uh, the hostel. As you can see, these gentlemen here are going to check people in. And also what's notable, uh, if you look at this, is that lots of the signs actually are on different languages, a recognition that if, and it is big if, uh, migrants do arrive here, they will be from uh, many different parts of the world. But there are 50 rooms in this complex, two people to a room, it could house up to 100 people. Let's have, let's have a look upstairs. The hostel is equipped with all sorts of stuff that you need for modern life, unsurprisingly. They've got internet rooms with laptops and computers that people access the internet, uh, communal laundry spaces here, and also communal bathrooms that the migrants uh, will be able uh, to use. Well, there's lots of communal space here for uh, the people who potentially move here, including prayer rooms. But we have to remember that the Labour Party have branded this as a workable, but also as immoral, and a policy uh, that they do not think should be happening. And we know also that there are many legal cases against all of this, and those cases, those legal proceedings, are likely to continue for the weeks and months to come. So as you can see, the facilities are pretty spacious, pretty airy. Frankly, they're quite smart in uh, this complex and we take you through to kind of show you what the rooms are like as I say the rooms are going to be shared uh, ultimately but you know they are very tidy they're very clean uh, there's a lot of space here even for uh, two people and in the end the government are hoping they're going to fill these rooms and the Rwandans it must be said themselves are very proud of these facilities and it's not just this complex there are others on standby as well but the big question of course for the government is ultimately, will people end up in these rooms? They've paid 120 million quid for them. The Rwandans tell them us they've already received that money. They've already spent that money. The big question is, if they cannot get this policy to work, those planes do not take off, will that money ultimately have been wasted for British taxpayers? Looks like a canny holiday if you ask me, but folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we're going to be heading to Scotland for all the latest on the Royal Highland Show. We'll be there live, but first, let's have a little look at what the weather's getting up to. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking breezy in the southeast and wet and windy in the north and west. Let's take a look at the details. In southwest England, there will be some showers for northern and western parts. Further east, it will be drier and sunnier, but a bit blustery. In southeast England, there will be plenty of sunshine this evening. It will be dry here with some high level cloud. Western parts of Wales will be windy, especially around coastal areas, with the showers continuing yes. here. <clears throat> Further east, yeah. it will be drier. The West Midlands is looking mostly fine throughout the evening, but it will be breezy, and there could be one of two showers here and there. The weather should be fine and quite warm for the northeast too. A few showers are possible, but it will be dry for most, especially near the coast. There'll be plenty of showers across Scotland, the heaviest in the west. Parts of the east should stay mostly dry. It will be quite windy here as well. It's a similar picture for Northern Ireland. There'll be plenty of showers as we head through the evening with some blustery winds here as well. Showers will continue to spread from the north and west overnight. Southeastern parts will remain fine. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
every morning from six o'clock. We'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news and the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now, folks, one of Scotland's most loved outdoor agricultural events finishes in Edinburgh today. The annual Royal Highland Show, which celebrates the best in farm and food and rural industry, is a four-day event and marks its 200th anniversary. Joining me now live from the show is GB News Scotland reporter David Donaldson. David, what's the atmosphere like there today with it wrapping up? Is it still as jubilant as the nice weather yesterday? Yesterday. Moving on to our Clydesdale females. Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic, the atmosphere here, the albeit it's the last up. day and we've That's got the parade ring behind us. Clydesdale we've had the cattle parade. We've now got the Clydesdales out on parade as well. And I have to say, having walked through the paddock earlier on and saw the size of them, oh my God, absolutely huge beasts and impressive. But yeah, it's been an absolutely phenomenal four days. Uh, the sun has shined most of it today with a little bit of rain, but it's been absolutely great. We've seen the bull parade, we've seen livestock, we've seen cattle, we've seen show jumping, uh, lots of stalls. Um, really, absolutely been a brilliant time for everyone. Lots of families here as well, uh, and hugely, well, a huge number of spectators. We've had 200,000 over the four days, so hugely impressive. And given it's the uh, 200th year of the Royal Highland Show, a lot of people wanted to come this year, especially after it being been cancelled previous years, so during COVID. But yeah, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Great time here. Everyone having a really good time. Lots of trophies being handed out to the winners, and I'm sure the breeding rights that they go with that. But yeah, this is this is a huge thing in Scotland, the Royal Highland Show. People coming from Wales and Ireland and England to compete here and hopefully uh, turn out their animals as best they can and, and, and get the certificates and the, and the trophies they're looking for. But it's not just that, as I say, it's much, much more than that. People come here to enjoy themselves, have a good time and relax. And I think, like we say, that uh, it's not been on over the last couple of years, then 
it's absolutely fantastic that it's on uh, this year and a couple of other things as well. The, I was down at the Shearing Championships earlier on, uh, which was phenomenal, I have to say, something I've never really seen close up, a sheep being sheared without electric shearers, just a hand shears and uh, shearing the, the fleece off the sheep. So something pretty impressive that. Um, but yeah, it was excellent. I have to say, really, really good. And this, of course, next year, the, uh, the shearing championships will be held here at next year's Royal Highland Show. Looks fantastic. Great weather for it. That was GB News' Scotland reporter David Donaldson there. Thank you very much for bringing us that live footage. Now, tomorrow marks the start of day one of Wimbledon as thousands of fans flock to SW19 to watch a star-studded lineup that features Andy Murray, Novak Djokovic, Rafael Nadal, Emma Raducanu and Serena Williams. So, will Djokovic defend his Wimbledon crown? And will Emma Raducanu, of course, the star of last year, overcome the minor injury she suffered over the season and prevail at tennis's most prestigious tournament? Well, joining me now is the sports writer at the Daily Mail, Mike Dixon. Mike, cheers very much for your time. Who's the favourite of the men and women's sport? <laughs> Um, well, I, I think clearly uh, Novak Djokovic is the favourite um, of the men's event, perhaps not quite the heavy favourite, I think, that he was um, in the last few years that he's been here. He's, but uh, you know, his pedigree at this event is fantastic. I mean, the women's event is, uh, as is now common, is absolutely wide open. I, I really wouldn't want to predict that. It's probably Iga Svontek of Poland uh, because she's been the best player in the world this year amongst the women for sure but uh, as ever it is extremely open women's event Emma Raducanu correct me if I'm wrong but her performance over recent events over recent games hasn't been what we sort of got used to I think when millions around the world Mike watched Raducanu win last year I think it was last year and what do you think's going on with the performance there uh, well, I think it's more the fact that the US Open was an outlier, really. Um, I mean, yeah. that was the exception rather than the rule. And perhaps what we're seeing now is more of representative of what her, her kind of true level is. Um, and obviously, she did something completely extraordinary in New York and expectations have, have ramped up because of that. But she really did that way ahead of the time that was predicted for her. And she missed out on a lot of the perhaps the building blocks of her career that her contemporaries have been through. So I think really what we're seeing at the moment is her playing catch up. Yes, exactly. But I'm wondering then, how big is Wimbledon in this country? How many people can we expect to be tuning in? Um, well, I mean, TV wise, um, because it's on the biggest network, it, you know, it attracts many millions and uh, one of the biggest sporting audiences uh, of the year is absolutely guaranteed. I mean, spectator-wise, um, thankfully, we're back to pretty much a normal Wimbledon um, in terms of the crowds um, for the first time since 2019. And there'll be uh, actually more than half a million people flocking here to see I, I must say it warms my heart to see so many people turning out and actually getting back into packing out events like Wimbledon but who's going to defend the crown then is Djokovic going to actually win the Wimbledon crown a lot of controversy actually around him hasn't there over recent times can he actually stay focused and deliver the goods um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that people, I mean, perhaps at the start of the year with when, you know, when he got deported from Australia, people might have expected that we might still be talking about you know, his vaccination status. Um, yeah. That that actually isn't an issue um, with him. Uh, so in pure tennis terms, he is, as I mentioned, clearly the favourite. I think... Uh, I think Andy Murray actually might do pretty well this year. I've heard he's been wow. uh, practising extremely well and um, he's obviously got a metal hip which which doesn't help him but he appears to be moving probably better than he's moved since his hip problem started in 2017 and I think he's uh, very much someone to look out for. Well we shall see we shall see but Mike Dixon there the sports writer 
at the Daily Mail. Thank you very much for your insight on Wimbledon and all that is coming up. You're with GB News folks on telly and DAB radio. Next, we're going to be discussing the Rotherham grooming scandal and a worrying new police report. I'll be speaking to a whistleblower. Stay with us for that. But now, time for a check on the news headlines. Nothing else. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 31 minutes past three. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Boris Johnson is pushing for more support for Ukraine at the G7 summit in Germany. He says the ban on Russian gold will cut the financial supply to Vladimir Putin's war machine. The UK, US, France, Japan and Canada have all agreed to the ban. They're also discussing placing a price cap on Russian oil. The European Council president, Charles Michel, agrees, saying the G7 leaders share the same goal. With G7 countries, we all share the same goals. To cut the oxygen from Russia's war machine while taking care of our economies and the economies of our partners. The EU will stand by the people of Ukraine for the long haul to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity and to strongly defend our common democratic values. For Ukraine. Missile strikes have hit the Ukrainian capital for the first time in weeks. Several people were trapped underneath fallen rubble and had to be pulled to safety after Russian forces hit homes near Kiev. At least six others were hurt. The city's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, says medics are still looking for survivors. Boris Johnson has said he's planning to serve two more terms in office. That's despite the Conservative Party suffering two by-election defeats this week. The Prime Minister said he's actively thinking about leading the country into the 2030s. Well, amid calls from within his own party to resign, he urged Tory MPs not to focus on the mistakes that he might have made. Families impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic may take legal action against the government over delays to starting the coronavirus public inquiry. The COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group says the six-month delay in appointing a chair and setting up dates goes beyond the reasonable time allowed by law. The Prime Minister previously said they agreed to do it in spring this year, but he hasn't set up a date yet. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll get back to Darren in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Well, welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now, folks, the police watchdog has concluded an eight-year investigation into how South Yorkshire police dealt with the abuse of more than 1,400 girls in Rotherham by grooming gangs. However, Sammy Woodhouse, a woman raped by one of the monsters as a teenager, has said she's disgusted by the failure of the report to hold any officers to account. None of the 47 officers investigated were sacked due to these findings. So I'm asking, will justice ever be done? Well, joining me now is former detective and Rochdale child sex abuse ring whistleblower, Maggie Oliver. Maggie, thank you very much for your company. I wonder if you can start by telling us if you see any similarities between what happened in Rochdale and what happened in Rotherham, actually. Um, good afternoon, Darren. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think you could very easily switch the town that these reports refer to. You know, you could say Rochdale or Rotherham or Oxford or Huddersfield. Um, the, the, the parameters and the, the, the problems are the same. And, um, you know, I'm known for the Rochdale case. That's what I resigned over because of the failures of the police and the CPS to deal with that. Um, but, you know, I've started my own charity, the Maggie Oliver Foundation, and we are dealing with cases, with current cases, every day of the week, um, and very little has actually changed. Um, what I would say, Darren, is that this report focuses on 47 officers in Rotherham um, that were, there were complaints submitted about those 47 officers. None of them were um, disciplined or sacked. Um, what I would say though, is that, you know, I first found out about the grooming gangs when I worked on Operation Augusta back in 2005, another identical case in and around Manchester City Centre. Um, and an independent review in, published in 2020 showed that Greater Manchester Police made a decision at gold level group meetings, which was chief constable, assistant chief constables. They did, decided to deliberately close down that job because they, the official reason was they were not prepared to put resources into prosecuting these men. Now, 15 years later, we have still not seen any senior officers ever held to account for these failures. You know, they scuttle out the door quickly as soon as there's a, a, a whiff of a, a scandal and junior officers are left to carry the can. Now, you know, in this report, junior officers have not been held to account, but nor have any senior officers. And, and I repeatedly say that for me, many of these failures the book stops at the top, and I want to see chief constables and assistant chief constables held to account, and I mean criminally. To me, they are guilty of misconduct in a public office. You know, they know, they, they make the decisions, they resource these investigations, and when something goes wrong, they all close ranks, they pretend nothing is wrong, and they cover up the failures, and it really, really needs to change because until in my opinion until we see at least one senior officer held to account I feel that we will continue to see these failures time and time again and, and it's absolutely scandalous. It is it is and my heart actually breaks for the the women involved here who have just been tossed to the side and they've said well you know you're just not important enough because of fears of accusations of racism and all these other things but Maggie I'm wondering if the police and you're a former copper if the police have priorities are those priorities more perhaps pandering to, to what we on this channel may describe as woke causes, right? It may be uh, protecting certain people over others. Do you think actually, as far as the pecking order of priorities for British policing are concerned, white working class women, I'm afraid, are right at the bottom of the pile? I think that there is some truth in that, Darren. Um, but I would also say that victims are at the bottom of the pile time and time again. Uh, I mean, there was a, a report this week in, in Ireland that victims of sexual abuse are having to wait up to five years to go to court. You know, that the whole system is failing. Um, I, I know that you're referring to the, the racial aspects of these crimes because it, it is undoubted that the, the vast majority of the perpetrators in the grooming gang cases 
are Pakistani Muslim men, and the vast majority of the victims are young um, white girls from from uh, very difficult backgrounds. Um, I really would like to open up the the debate and question why that happens. You know, why do we repeatedly see that same pattern of behavior? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was a police officer, when I was a serving police officer, I dealt with um, incidents where women within that community were also being treated as second-class citizens, being forced into arranged marriages. There, there is a real um, problem with how women are seen within those communities. So whilst that dynamic is here in these cases, I think that the problems go far deeper than that. And, you know, prioritising these cases is, um, is, is critical. And the Rotherham Review, as did Augusta, um, highlighted the fact that police forces back then were getting ticks in boxes for... Um, um, crimes like burglary, theft from motor vehicle, mm -hmm. acquisitive crime. They were getting um, uh, bonuses and extra payments for solving those crimes. Consequently, rapes and sexual abuse went right to the bottom of the pile. But what I would say, Darren, is that every time one of these reports come out, on Monday we had the Oldham Review, on Wednesday yeah. we had the, the Rotherham Review, uh, on Friday, we had the uh, Rochdale abusers in in court fighting deportation, saying that it would um, it would contravene their human rights. What I would say is that these are not historical problems. You know, my mm -hmm. work within the Maggie Oliver Foundation, we deal with with two two sides of this problem. We have an emotional support um, side to the foundation where we support victims who. Have, have usually been abused in the past and are um, unable to come to terms with how the system has failed them as well as the abuse they've suffered. But we also have a legal advocacy service and, you know, every single day we are contacted by victims who are being failed by the police and the, the criminal justice system today. They don't know where else to turn. They go to the police forces, they're fobbed off. We um, join alongside them and put pressure on individual police forces to take their cases forward. So when I hear Steve Watson, the, the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester, saying, you know, we're apologising yet again for the failures of the past. We've got them apologising about Rotherham and saying this is in the past. Yeah. It isn't in the past. It is today. And it's no good keep on doing another report and another report when nothing actually changes. You know, it, it, it's I want to change it for exactly. generations to come. I don't want to keep um, having to pick up the pieces of destroyed lives from kids um, who really are like second-class citizens. They they are bottom of the pile all the well, time. Well, exactly, Maggie. Exactly. And, 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 and as you well know, in your foundation, what you've seen time and again is the fact that these young girls, it's not in the past for these young girls. It actually dictates their future, right? These young girls' lives are decimated by the abuse yeah. that they've suffered that the police have turned a blind eye to. And frankly, I think most of my viewers will want to thank you for all you're doing, but at the same time, really chastise the UK and the fact that, Maggie, as you've just said, grooming is still happening in Britain. It's happening in, you know, in, in towns and cities all through the country. Um, I think this particular kind of gram is predominantly in the north of England. But, you know, I've been speaking out about this for 15 years and I wish I didn't have to say anything anymore because I feel like a broken record. But the situation really hasn't changed. And, you know, the powers that be would have the public believe that this is a problem of the past. It isn't. Victims are being failed every single day. Victims are mm -hmm. actually being criminalised. They are being pushed away. The abusers are not getting the sentences, even when they are prosecuted, which is extremely rare. You know, um, the, the, the guy who he was in court on Friday arguing against deportation, he got a 13-year-old child pregnant in Rochdale. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. You know, he thinks that, you know, it's no big deal, but they are his words. Now, they are the kinds of attitudes that as a country we need to address. Exactly. We still do not record the ethnicity 
of the abusers in these cases? That's another question. Why not? Why are we not yeah. looking further than just the prosecutions? We need to be getting into the communities. I want to see the Muslim councils of Great Britain, you know, shouting out that this is not right within that religion. I want to see change. I want to see action. And I want to see senior police officers who fail to act lose the job Absolutely. and stand in a court of law. Maggie, I couldn't agree with you more. And I would be saying exactly the same thing if it was some, you know, some Christian who was doing this sort of committing this kind of atrocity. But you mentioned the deportation point. I wonder if you would just very briefly tell my viewers why they can't actually be deported. Well, there it, it was when they were sentenced back in 2012. Um, and in my and I've never changed my opinion. They were um, charged with with lesser offences for the crimes that they were guilty of. So the man I'm talking about there, his name is Adil Khan. He was found guilty of getting a 13-year-old child. She was just 13, pregnant. We had a fetus. DNA proved that he was responsible for that. The CPS at the time, the, the chief prosecutor, chose... Um, only to charge that man with sexual activity with a child, not with rape. Now, she was drunk. She was a child of 13. For me, he should have been charged with rape. He should have gone to, to prison for 20 years, in my opinion, but he didn't. He was out yeah. in less than four years. And because he was only charged with sexual activity with a child, the judge decided um, when he was convicted that he would be deported together with another two as soon as they were released from prison. That was six, and seven, then he wasn't. eight years ago now. And they're yeah. still in this country. Um, he has had millions in legal aid saying that it would contravene his human rights. And can you actually believe that he is saying that he has got his own... I know, Maggie. This, this to me, term. is is a fundamental reason of why we actually need human rights reform in this country. But we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. But, Maggie, I thank you dearly for, for your insight into this really, really depressing state of affairs. That was the former detective and Rochdale child sex abuse ring whistleblower, Maggie Oliver. Now, folks, it appears the NHS is suffering crisis after crisis. The list is ever grown. Dentists have warned that it'll take years to clear the COVID backlog of 43 million appointments that were missed due to the pandemic, according to the British Dental Association. We're also in the midst of the worst recruitment and retention crisis in NHS dentistry since the health service was created in 1948. With me, that was after a world war, let's not forget. With me now is dentist and member of the General Dental Practice Committee, Mark Green. Mark, I wonder if you can just tell my viewers, have you any hope whatsoever of clearing this backlog? Well, the backlog, I don't think is ever going to be cleared if we, if we have the current contract that we have. Um, that's the reason we have the problem is the contract that was uh, issued in 2006 which has been deemed unfit for purpose since 2008, is still in position. So it's it's because of that contract and the lack of any uh, impetus to change that is we're really in the situation we are as we are. Um, there's no more uh, dentists wanting to come into the NHS. They're all wanting to leave because of the, the conditions they're working under. Uh, added to that, the, the COVID has just exacerbated the problem. Yeah. I mean, some people claim that this is down to a lack of investment, but it strikes me that we're pouring ever increasing sums into the system and actually outcomes aren't improving. So what's going on in your view? It's it's the measurement of outcomes that they, they in this current contract, which is very it's oversimplified. But basically, you can get paid the same for doing one filling or 20 fillings. So if you've got a high needs patient, there's no, you're going to be losing money doing those patients. So practices need to be financially viable to continue. So the reason they, they're looking for a different uh, income stream is from the uh, the private sector to, to bolster paying their staff. It's not just okay, the dentist. Sorry obviously. about this. We're, we're actually losing your audio there. It's cracking up. But that was the dentist, a member of the General Dental Practice Committee, Mark Green, that we sadly couldn't keep on the line there. Now, folks, not since the Norman Conquest has Britain had so many dear Rome in the countryside. Bambi galore. The population boomed in lockdown and hunting has declined. Now there are an estimated two million of the species, creating absolute havoc and harm in the ecosystem. The government, therefore, is planning a mass cull 
full. But I say, why waste the meat? Yummy, yummy, yummy in my tummy. So is it time for us to start eating British venison? Dear meat, and could it even help ease our cost of living crisis? Well, with me now is farmer, environmentalist and meat advocate Gareth Wynne-Jones. Gareth, as you well know, you've been on this show debating vegans before. I must have just sent them into a state of shock. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, state of shock. Um, I think this is a great idea. Um, I've had so much venison on my plate, and it's amazing. I make the best venison burgers you'll ever have, and um, I use um, wild bilberries, and I'll put in our burgers some blackberries, and let me tell you, I've had some top people up here eating them and saying they're the best burgers ever. Win Evans was one of them, the uh, Go Compare singer. Uh, he, he can vouch for that. So, um, yeah, let's drive forward in eating sustainable meat. And um, definitely deer is part of that. We need to keep control of these animals like everything else. If I get an overpopulation of rabbits on my farm, I need to take them out or they'll take too much of the grass that my sheep and cows eat. So we keep the number of rabbits down. Um, So do the foxes as well, they help with that. But, you know, there's nothing nicer than game. You know, pheasants, rabbit, deer, and it's all really nutritious and very, very healthy for you. So the, we know that the numbers boomed during lockdown, right? Because no one was leaving the houses, right? You'd be lucky if you were able to go out there and do any hunting or anything of that nature. But what damage do these deers, given the boom in population, what do these deers actually manage to do to like young trees, for example, and the wider ecosystem that you've sort of touched on there? Yeah, they're, they're, they're a major problem. You know, they'll take a lot of saplings, young trees that are coming through. Um, so they need to be controlled. A few of them, like everything else, is fine. Um, they do carry TB as well. They can be a problem um, right. carrying TB from one place to another. But, you know, I think like everything, we need to keep the population numbers down in a healthy way. The deer is healthy then. You know, we're, we're going to be getting really good meat here that isn't going to be too dear. <laughs> for the yeah, population yeah. to eat. I see what but, you did so there. It, Very good. <laughs> but it's really important that we get the message out there, you know. Sustainable food is really going to be something that's going to tick a lot of boxes in the future. And deer is part of that. And, you know, by managing them, we're helping the ecosystem as well. But they are part of that ecosystem. So we have to, you know, respect them, enjoy them. But when we get an overpopulation, yeah, let's keep the numbers down. Let's not cull them and waste them. Let's cull them and eat them. Get people back eating, you know, game. It's really important. Gareth, then, I wonder if you agree with me that actually this is a more environmentally friendly, not just because of the damage done to trees, but actually if you're eating local, if you're eating British and brand Britain as a fantastic brand, you know, eating this meat surely would make any genuinely green activist absolutely jubilant. Exactly, but we're hearing environmentalists telling us not to be eating meat. You know, some of these people, well, you know, they're really going against everything that is common sense if they're telling us not to eat deer as well. We have to have a balance. You know, we have our ecosystems and we cannot keep reaping and pillaging the land. The soil is the important thing. Our habitats are important. So if we farm in a respectful and um, eco-friendly way, so sustainable, local, seasonal, regenerative, and environmentally produced food, meat, whatever it is, that's definitely the way forward. And you know, we can do this. We can build a better Britain on our bellies. And going forward, you know, our country needs more food security. We are on a brink of food shortages. And venison could be a big part in feeding people affordably. Let's not forget that. You know, these these are big, big questions that we all should be asking ourselves going forward. You know, they they want us to be eating plant-based foods because they believe it's going to save the planet. Well, I say that is poppycock. We need to be eating local, sustainable and regenerative. And livestock are a big part of that equation. 
Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And you know what? I say the pandemic actually showed us, Gareth, that we need to be producing more here at home. But that was the farmer and telly personality, Gareth Wynne-Jones. I thank you for your insight. Now, folks, you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. This show is on every Saturday and Sunday at two o'clock. But for now, folks, I'll leave you with the weather. So looking ahead then to this evening's weather and the UK looking breezy in the southeast and wet and windy in the northwest. Let's take a look at the detail. So in southwest England then there will be some showers for northern and western parts, further east, drier and sunnier but blustery. In southeast England, plenty of sunshine this evening, very dry here with some high level cloud as well. Then looking at western parts of Wales, well, in this area, it's going to be fairly windy, especially around coastal areas with showers continuing here. Further east, it will be drier. The West Midlands looking mostly fine throughout the evening, but it will be breezy and there could be one or two showers here and there. And the weather fine and warm for the northeast of England as well but it will be very breezy and there could be one or two showers here and there. The weather fairly fine and quite warm for the southwest of England. A few showers possible, but dry for most near the coast. And plenty of showers across Scotland, the heaviest in the west. Parts of the east should stay mostly dry and windy as well. A similar picture for Northern Ireland. Plenty of showers as we head through the evening, blustery winds as well. So showers continuing to spread from the north and west overnight, southwestern parts remaining fine, and that's how the weather's shaping up. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell news.